Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Maybe we should start. It's about time. I hope you're enjoying the meeting, are you? It's already fun, it's only day two, imagine day five. Uh, it's, it's a great uh, event, uh, as, as you already noticed, and uh, like I said yesterday morning, uh, please make the best out of it, you know, do networking, uh, talk to people as much as you can, uh, learn as much as you can. This is really an amazing opportunity. So this is my name, these are my affiliations, and this is what I'm gonna talk about. Uh, HPC challenges uh, in the area of plasma physics. Um, obviously, uh, some of uh, what I'm going to talk about will be targeted, uh, you know, to this topic of plasma physics. But some of it is generic. So even if you have interests in different research areas, I think there are still things you can take away from this talk. So stay tuned. Uh, just a little bit of background: Why are we doing this kind of research? I'm going to talk about this in a, in a few minutes. Uh, this is a projection of uh, the electricity consumption between now and the end of the century, uh, and experts expect that uh, the demand will increase by a factor of about five or so. Uh, so this is a worldwide uh, trend, of course, in particular in developing countries and large countries like India, China, and so forth, but also in other parts of the world. So how are we gonna cover this energy, of course, uh, many people talk about renewables, and they have a role to play for sure. Uh, but there's another uh, solution on the table, and that's fusion energy. About a century ago, people discovered uh, that the sun produces uh, its energy by the fusion of light nuclei, uh, hydrogen nuclei, in several stages to helium. And according to Einstein's famous formula, uh, a little bit of mass gets lost and is turned into energy, and that's the radiation that reaches the Earth, among other things. And uh, the idea came up uh, to use a similar process on Earth uh, to create electricity. Instead of hydrogen, we use deuterium and tritium, two heavy versions of hydrogen. They fuse and create helium nucleus and a neutron. Uh, and the neutron, in particular, is then uh, plays an important role in the electricity production. However, these two guys uh, are positively charged and repel each other. In order to circumvent uh, this force, one has to create very high temperatures uh, above 100 million degrees or so. And uh, in this, uh, under these circumstances, we're dealing with a fully ionized gas or a plasma. So the collisions get so hefty uh, that the electrons are stripped away from, from the gas uh, uh, atoms or molecules, and uh, everything is ionized. And then you have a gas of electrically charged particles, and that's a plasma. Now, how are you going to work with such a hot plasma? Uh, this is the basic idea. So every, everybody here is charged. Uh, if you apply a strong magnetic field, then the particles will gyrate uh, in, in this fashion, helical trajectories about the field lines. So at least in two directions, you have now confined them. You can keep them away from material walls, but not in the third dimension, unless uh, you take the magnetic field lines and bend them in a way that they form uh, toroidal surfaces. So these are all nested toroidal surfaces created by, in part, these red coils and in part by a current that flows in the plasma. And this uh, device is called a tokamak, and that's the leading effort. That's one example. Uh, the tokamak that we operate uh, at my home institution, the Max Planck Institute for Plasma Physics in Garching near Munich. So this is the progress that has been made as measured in the following way. So in order to reach a state where the plasma produces so much energy that it heats itself and allows for electricity production, uh, the pressure in the core of this device has to exceed a certain threshold multiplied by uh, a large energy confinement time, which measures how well does this magnetic device uh, keep the plasma away from the wall. And there's a problem there because we have 100 million degrees in the core, about a meter away. We have room temperature. So these enormous temperature gradients and, ter and also density gradients lead to turbulent fluctuations. And as you know uh, very well from, for instance, stirring a coffee cup to distribute the milk very quickly, turbulence mixes things very well, so it transports things well. Uh, in some cases, this is uh, beneficial, like uh, engines of cars, motorcycles. In some cases, uh, it's the opposite, like in fusion research. 
So we want to understand and control this kind of turbulent transport. This is the next step. This is an international project which is currently being built. And uh, there are contributions from all over the world, also from Japan, Korea, China, India, Russia, European Union, and the United States. Uh, everyone uh, contributes to uh, this big experiment. And this is how the construction site looks uh, right now. And uh, the first experiments are supposed to begin uh, in the mid-20s. So that's the goal. So that's all background. And now I want to uh, say a few words about the role of high performance computing in this context. So in the old days, a few decades ago, and until not so recently, uh, there was a trend that this whole uh, area of research was mainly experiment driven. So if somebody had an idea, you build the experiment, uh, you try out the idea, if it works fine, if not, you, know, you try something else. Everything was sufficiently cheap and small and fast, you could do that. But now we have reached a stage where experiments take decades from you know, the first ideas to actually starting of operation. Uh, uh, it costs many billion uh, euros or dollars uh, to build these things. Uh, and obviously, you know, the times of a pure trial and error approach are over and we need uh, computing to help us, in particular high performance computing, because as I will show you in the next slides, everything is, is quite complicated. So, as you may or may not know, uh, fusion research has been at the forefront of supercomputing ever since the 70s. Uh, in the US today, we still have the, the NERSC Computing Center in California, and this was started in the 70s during the oil crisis. So, initially, it was uh, meant to support uh, fusion research only. It was meant to help accelerate fusion research. And then later in the 80s, it was opened up to other areas of research. Today, of course, it serves the entire scientific community, including fusion and many others. Uh, but it started uh, in the 70s uh, as a fusion research center. And uh, this is the development I'm going to show you in, uh, in the simulation capabilities in our field since uh, the 90s or so. So this was the 90s. We had gigaflop devices. Uh, simplified geometries, uh, simplified physics. Uh, so at this stage, we're more or less interested in, in providing proofs of principle. So we can, in principle, simulate, for instance, turbulent transport, but uh, no one was taking this too seriously in terms of quantitative results. In the zero years, this gradually changed. Uh, the physics and geometry became more and more realistic, and uh, people started to compare uh, simulation results with experimental measurements. This was nice, and now in the tens, this has become uh, a daily practice. Uh, literally, every day, people carry out these simulations, make predictions, provide explanations, uh, and interpretation for experiments. So this is where we are right now. Uh, and where I think we should be headed, it will be headed, must be headed, is to develop a predictive capability in order to help guide experiments beyond ITER. I mean, ITER is now designed, it's being built and operated. Uh, but for the next step device, beyond either, uh, we definitely need something like a virtual fusion device uh, which uh, can guide experimentalists in uh, optimizing uh, the experiments in various ways. So uh, this is the challenge, not unlike many other uh, areas, for, for instance, material science, biophysics, astrophysics. Often we have uh, many orders of magnitude in terms of length and time scales which must be covered. There's different uh, physical processes uh, taking place, and they interact with each other in, in very complex ways. Uh, often people try to emphasize only one of these boxes to say, let's look at this aspect of the system. Uh, but obviously, uh, if you're really interested in a, in a realistic and reliable predictive uh, capability, uh, then you have to take into account that all of these processes talk to each other. And you cannot just use something like a superposition principle where one thing doesn't know about the other. And uh, this is all done in the context of a multi-fidelity approach. So you have, uh, like on a step ladder, you have a high fidelity model, which is very precise but expensive. And then you can maybe develop reduced models at lower cost, but uh, maybe less realism or free parameters or something. So you're going to uh, end up paying some price as you go down. But the idea would be then to couple these dynamically 
in one simulation, not separately, but to do many of these and some of these in, in a coupled sense to give, uh, to, to provide uh, realistic, reliable predictions with a strongly reduced efforts. That's something we're currently working on. And one of the high fidelity tools that we are using in this context is the gene code, uh, which I started to develop about 20 years ago. And since then, uh, a team of people that I lead uh, worldwide, actually, uh, has continued to work on this. So just a little bit of background. Uh, these plasmas are very hot, as we learned, 100 million degrees or so. At the same time, very dilute, like a, a millionth of the atmospheric density. Under these conditions, collisions are extremely rare. And therefore, you cannot use a fluid approach, which is always based on the assumption that you have so many collisions that you are st you're staying close to a Maxwellian distribution. But this is not necessarily the case in these plasmas. So you could use uh, this kind of uh, equation. This is a Vlasov or collisionless Boltzmann equation for this uh, distribution function in a six-dimensional phase space, uh, three spatial and three velocity space coordinates. Uh, this could be solved, but uh, it would be horrible, even the modern supercomputers, because there is so many space and time scales involved uh, that you don't really need to address this problem. For instance, uh, this system knows something about the so-called Debye length, which in our system is 10 to the minus 5 meters. It's ridiculously small. Uh, the smallest scales to be interested in are in the millimeter range. So you would waste a lot of resources. And therefore, people have uh, come up with an idea uh, to reduce this system of equations. And this is just one example that you meet uh, across the board in many scientific areas, uh, also in supercomputing, particularly in supercomputing. Uh, before you even think about coding something up, be sure that you have a, a minimal uh, model description. That's realistic enough, but uh, that, that you're not wasting resources by, by just uh, throwing everything on, on, on a big machine. And that's exactly what we're doing here. So uh, instead of uh, solving this equation, we solve an equation for the centers of these helical trajectories. And this uh, theory has been developed since the 1980s until today. Uh, it's called gyrokinetics. And when we do this, as it turns out, uh, we can reduce the effort by at least 12 orders of magnitude. That's huge. It's gigantic. So even the world's most powerful supercomputer, like Summit, uh, could not solve this equation for our uh, problems of interest if it weren't for this uh, introduction of uh, gyrokinetics. So without going into much detail, this is the uh, code that I want to talk about, Gene. Uh, it has about 100,000 lines of source code and another 200,000 lines for pre- and post-processing. Uh, the numerical methods are really borrowed from computational fluid dynamics. There's a lot of finite differences. Uh, there's also finite elements, finite volume in the uh, velocity space. Uh, we follow an open, open source policy. So we have a website where people can get the code. Uh, we also have uh, support. Uh, if people uh, want to work with the code and they run into problems, they can shoot an email to us. And typically, within a few hours, they get a response and some help. Uh, the code is also used in astrophysics, and uh, this is a chart from about a year ago. These are all the institutions around the world where Gene is currently being used for both fusion and astrophysical applications. This is just uh, an idea uh, to give you an idea of uh, what this typically looks like when, when we uh, simulate turbulence. So again, we have 100 million degrees in the core. We have room temperature outside. These strong density gradients drive certain uh, what we call micro instabilities, small scale instabilities that grow exponentially until nonlinear interactions kick in and they lead to this turbulent mess, which unfortunately leads to large losses in the radial direction. And those are the ones that determine the energy confinement time. And we want to get this number as high as possible. So this works against our original plan to have magnetic confinement. And we need to address this issue. We need to understand what's going on and uh, control this process. Some background on gene. Uh, so we have uh, PDEs, partial differential equations. And we introduce a fixed grid in five-dimensional phase space. So you probably have seen this in two- or three-dimensional settings where people introduce grids, for instance, in uh, Navier-Stokes. Uh, and similar things are done here, only a little bit more complicated because we have this mix of various methods. 
Uh, we use explicit time stepping. I considered uh, implicit time stepping for quite a while, but it turns out uh, that this would not buy it too much, uh, but it would create a huge overhead and would make parallelization much, much harder. So that's why we, we stuck with this. Uh, the time step, on the other hand, is maximized during initialization. So every time stepping scheme has a stability region. Uh, in this case, we linearize the system and then we calculate the eigenvalues during the initialization. And if we pick a time step that's just uh, uh, large enough uh, to make the system uh, stable, uh, so this is the maximum time step uh, we can still run with, a little bit smaller, and the system uh, would go unstable. In terms of parallelization, we use 5D domain decomposition. And the code during the initialization can play with various ways uh, uh, to, to uh, do the domain composition differently, more in one direction, less in the other direction. And then it uh, picks the, the one uh, decomposition that's most efficient. Uh, we use either a pure MPI uh, programming model or a hybrid MPI CUDA OpenACC. Uh, this is a, a longer story. Uh, originally, we worked with CUDA, and then I know many of you probably are in this OpenACC track. And you learned a lot yesterday and today about OpenACC. Uh, we also like it a lot. On, on the other hand, uh, we work with the PGI compiler. And uh, we use some, this is within Fortran 2008. Uh, the PGI compiler didn't like some of our Fortran 2008 features. Then we had to walk away from OpenACC and go back to CUDA. So we're somewhere in between right now. Um, we can talk later if, if you're interested. And uh, Gene also knows about auto-tuning. So uh, we have now uh, several uh, subroutines or versions of subroutines that do number crunching. And uh, again, Gene can try out your initialization, which one works best on a given architecture, and then work with that. Just uh, quickly to let you know that, of course, a lot of effort goes into verification and validation. Code verification means are we solving the equations right? So assuming that we have the right equations, are we getting the right answers? And you can, for instance, compare the results by different codes. This has been done. This is just one example. In code validation means are we solving the right equations? Is, are these equations realistic enough? Uh, can we compare this uh, with experiments? And as you can see here in some cases, uh, and sometimes this was uh, work of several man years to get to this point, so it's not that you know, you switch on the simulation and you get the right answer. Sometimes you have to learn a thing or two until you get there, but this is extremely valuable. And again, this is something that every research area, of course, should worry about. Uh, very quickly to science highlights, uh, things that were discovered by means of these gyrokinetic simulations, which you would never have imagined by just looking at the equations. Uh, so one is shown here. Uh, you have a picture of an actual tokamak, uh, but of course, a, a simulation of, of that machine. And you see these very small structures, and uh, you could think that maybe that's noise or something, but it's not. This is physics. This is uh, turbulence at very, very small scales, uh, submillimeter, so small that typically in the past people have always neglected that. Gene has predicted that there is, so this is the wave number, and this is the transport done at a given wave number range. There is something on, on these scales, but there is a lot also on these very small scales. This was predicted first in the early 2000s, and then uh, about 10 years later, it was experimentally confirmed. So this is one step in the direction, predict first, and then look for it. And uh, now we're also interested in explaining in particular what happens in the outer few centimeters, where sometimes you have these very steep profiles of temperature. Uh, this we call an edge transport barrier, and Gene plays a key role in the world to explain what's going on out there. And this is key for fusion research. So just two, two uh, examples. So Gene runs on the world's largest supercomputers. This was from Titan. This point corresponds to 90% of the machine. Strong scaling, so keeping the problem size fixed and, and increasing the number of cores. Um, and uh, I just want to note here that uh, whereas in Previous, uh, uh, um, when there was previous upgrades from one system to the other, sometimes uh, the effort was measured in man weeks. Now it's measured in, in man years. And this is not untypical. And of course, now we're moving on to Summit, which is the biggest computer as of today. 
There's uh, a lot of software engineering that goes into this, uh, but there will be a separate talk, I think, later this afternoon. Uh, so I'm not going to go into any detail. I just want to mention that uh, even you know, the physicists in, in our team had to acknowledge with time that this is uh, not just nice to have, but it's vital. Uh, if you don't have that, uh, uh, you get lost sooner or later with this development. So, so this is uh, uh, extremely important if you have sufficiently large or even moderate sized uh, projects. So uh, a lot of what happens is not just brute force. I already explained that going from kinetics to gyrokinetics was a vital step. If we hadn't done that, we would not be able today to do these simulations. But there's, there's more, there's uh, stuff on top of that uh, that comes from applied math and computer science. And just a few examples. Uh, so one is uh, sparse grid techniques. So here the idea is uh, that you beat the so-called curse of dimensionality, uh, which means that as dimensionality increases, the number of points you have to keep goes, goes up dramatically. Uh, you basically hit a wall at some point. Uh, but you can beat this at least to some degree uh, by running uh, on, on such grids, which have reduced resolution. And the magic is, uh, applied math tells you that if you do this systematically, so for instance, you do these three guys, you add them up, you do those two, you subtract them, you get a good approximation to the real thing. And this is an example, a uh, slightly different case. These four guys minus these three guys give you this, which is very close to the real thing. So instead of doing a high resolution run, you do several runs uh, on, on low resolution, you combine them according to certain rules provided by applied math, and uh, then you get your approximation. Uh, you know, if you're interested, this is one of the key uh, people in this field who I work together with on this. And uh, this has several uh, advantages apart from increasing efficiency. It also uh, introduces a new level of parallelism. Because if you have now several of these systems running, uh, you can, of course, uh, run them completely independently. So uh, the only thing then is that typically these, these different size grids have different run times, and you need to have a scheduler uh, that allows you to set those up in a, in a convenient way. And we're doing this uh, right now more and more with the help of uh, neural networks, which give us predictions for these run times. Another advantage is that you have algorithmic fault tolerance. So for instance, uh, if out of these five, uh, maybe uh, this, the, the system crashes in a way, let's say a node fails, and, and you lose the simulation. Then you can either rerun only this case, or you can just forget about it and uh, use a slightly different linear combination, uh, which also applied math provides you to get a slightly less accurate prediction, but still uh, a valuable uh, way to proceed. And uh, you can just move on. And this is something we have also implemented, uh, actually, and, uh, and this works in practice now. So this is another topic that, that we have started to investigate, lossy compression of scientific data. As you well know, the compute power is increasing faster than memory bandwidth. And uh, memory becomes more and more, as we heard yesterday morning, for instance, uh, becomes a bottleneck. Moving data around is much more uh, uh, energy con uh, consuming and time consuming than actually doing the flops. Um, so maybe you could think about lossless compression, uh, but you get only factors of maybe a few percent in gain, so that's not a, a game changer. Instead, you could think about lossy compression, but that makes uh, many people nervous uh, for no good reason, I would say, because we have, in these simulations, uh, we have different types of errors all the time anyways. Round of error, truncation error, iteration error. So we have uh, you know, errors left and right. Why not accept the fact that we have to live with certain inaccuracies and uh, think about if we can uh, loosen uh, up a little bit and, and allow for some lossy compression at least. So here is an example by some colleagues, uh, Hohmann and Grauer, from about 10, 12 years ago. And what they did is they studied uh, a turbulent uh, system. Uh, this is the energy spectrum as a function of wave number. 
And what they did is they used uh, a single precision calculation, which is the red line. Hard to see, but it's underneath the green one. And then they cut the mantissa of 23 bits by 0, 9, 11, and 13, which is radical if you think about it. And for a long time, not much changes, only if they go from 23 to 10 bits in the in mantissa, then they start to see significant deviations. So that indicates that there may be a lot of room for data reduction. And we did the same for Gene. We're using the CFP uh, compressor, which was developed at Livermore. Uh, and it can be run in, in three different ways. And what we did is, uh, so this is a typical time trace. The heat flux at a given radial position as a function of time, then we do a time average. We're not interested in the actual time trace, only the average value. And these are the average values as a function of the compression ratio for these three different ways to compress. And as you can see, we can go up to a compression ratio of about 10 without any significant change in the quantity of interest which is remarkable because it means that there's probably a lot to be gained even in the simulation. This has been done in a way that at every time step we write out the data, we compress, decompress, feedback, and continue. So this was just a kind of a sensitivity study, but uh, this means that you can go into the simulation in the code and reduce uh, the data uh, by a factor of maybe five to 10 uh, without harming the system a whole lot. So that's pretty remarkable. And that's something we want to do in the next stage. And that's something that, that other uh, applications are also considering right now. And in the last uh, few minutes, three minutes, I guess, uh, just a few words about a very ambitious project uh, that we're currently involved in. As, uh, as you know, in 21, the US uh, shoots for the first exascale system. Uh, and um, it's developed by the so-called Exascale Computing Project. This is a multi-billion dollar project over seven years. And it, and it supports everything from hardware to system software to applications. And we are part of the application pillar. The idea is to take two geokinetic codes, Gene, which is optimized for the core, and XGC, a code from Princeton, which is optimized for the boundary region, uh, and couple them dynamically via a, an overlap zone, and later on maybe also couple in other types of tools, but for now we're only interested in coupling these two. The first step, obviously, is to make sure that the two codes, when they run the same problem, give the same answers, and that we have uh, established. The next thing is we take one code, in this case XGC, and couple it to itself to make things a little easier. And uh, what you see now in the movie is on the left, uh, is, uh, is a simulation of a coupled simulation. So between these white lines is the overlap region where the two simulations are coupled. And this is a reference simulation uh, that covers the entire volume. Uh, and again, you should not compare details, but the statistics, and, and it's very similar, as you can also see here, for instance, in these uh, time traces, if you take the average values, for instance. And then in a third step, we actually couple the two codes, Gene in the core, XGC in the boundary, and again, uh, the average values, which are what we're interested in right here, coincide nicely. And this is also an idea that is being explored in other uh, contexts. Whenever you have multi-physics uh, uh, things going on or different spatial domains with different requirements, for instance, you could think about such a coupling technique, uh, which we uh, have uh, started to explore here. Uh, and uh, a few last comments before I finish up. Uh, last fall, I co-organized a so-called long program over three months at UCLA. And uh, we had a lot of people there from different companies, but also from many universities, to explore the theme uh, of science at extreme scales, where big data meets large-scale computing. People uh, more and more have the impression that uh, Data analytics needs HPC. HPC benefits from, uh, from data science, data analytics, uh, machine learning, and so forth. And uh, this has been acknowledged, for instance, also in the context of fusion. People have said that these advanced algorithms, in particular, that come from uh, uh, machine learning, AI, and so forth, in addition to the established tool of simulation, 
are a game changer, and also in the context of combining the two. So here is one example. Deep learning applied to an inversion problem. Uh, you have measurements along these lines of sight, and then you need to invert this to get a prediction for the 2D uh, structure. And this was done with deep learning recently, and uh, also uh, in a way where you have unsupervised inversion, which for the first time gives us the possibility to do this inversion in real time to uh, allow for uh, real-time control of these plasma systems. And we do this also for an instability that we hate to have, disruptions. This current that flows, an enormously large current, can uh, start to flow uh, very quickly and then uh, cause harm to the machine. And complicated uh, neural networks have been set up to predict these. Uh, and this is similar maybe to predicting financial data or earthquakes. And what we're doing is now we try to integrate physics knowledge into the design of these neural networks. That's something that has not yet been done in our field. And same happens in other fields because why would you be a physics agnostic if you know something in advance because you know the equations or you know you have physical insights or experience, by all means put it into the neural networks. Uh, and you can also combine neural networks uh, or machine learning and simulation in different ways. For instance, in, the, in this movie, you see a simulation that was done by solving Navier-Stokes equations. But in this context, you have to solve a pressure equation, which is basically uh, a Poisson type equation, which is a little uh, expensive to do. And in this case, machine learning has been used to replace this solve. So we don't have uh, this Poisson solve any longer, but this is re has been replaced by machine learning. And uh, in the fall, we start a project where we want to do the same for plasma systems. And this is my conclusion. Uh, the overarching goal in our area is to contribute uh, to the development of a validated predictive capability. And this can help to accelerate fusion research dramatically and make it cheaper, faster. Uh, it's quite fascinating, I think, to work on the lar largest supercomputers in the world. Uh, and uh, at the same time help to uh, solve uh, great challenges that we're facing as uh, societies right now. Uh, and it's really also fascinating to live at the interface of applied math, computer science, and physics. It's this work is highly interdisciplinary, as you can imagine. And again, this applies to other fields too. And this is, I guess, one of the particular uh, um, beauties and, and nice sides of the kind of work that's also represented at, at this particular school. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Frank.